on their own, right. each one of these would probably look great and would, you know, it's going to yeah. be, you know, a very fun experience at home. But when you right. see them side by side, you really start to see the finer differences between them. Happy listening from our sponsor, SVS. Acclaimed for punching well above their class, experience thrilling and immersive sound from SVS speakers, subwoofers, and cables. Join the sound revolution today. Visit svsound.com. Now on with the show. Today we're talking about the best ultra short throw projectors. And I'm here with our new editor at large, Chris Boylan. How you doing, Chris? Hey, doing well, Brian. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. I, I hear you were just at the Value Electronics ultra short throw projector shootout. Uh, what can you tell us about that event? It's UST projectors, which are also known as laser TVs, um, because they are pretty much standalone projectors that are TV replacements. Um, this year, they also expanded the event yet again to long throw projectors, which we'll talk about in part two. But they won on Saturday uh, at the company building in Manhattan was all UST projectors. All right. And I think they took five models they had up for a head to head battle where they, they lined did. them up um, side by side and had a panel of judges, if it's my understanding, judging that every is, aspect of yeah. these projectors. That's correct. They had a pretty um, wide array of content. Each piece of content was uh, selected to highlight a different area of display performance. So um, they had some dark scenes for shadow detail, some very bright snow scenes for highlight detail. Um, they had skin tones, lots and lots of skin tones, um, because one thing we can judge pretty well as humans is, is how his skin tones look. And, right. and not just pink skin tones, but the whole range, you know, multiple shades. Um, and they also had some motion resolution tests, some upscaling tests, the typical stuff you see when you're looking at a display. You know, how does it do on not so great content? How does it do on 4K content? And then how does it do on 4K HDR content? So the whole range. And right. they, they picked a pretty good selection from, I guess, five different vendors, uh, each representing uh, similar technology, but you know, a little bit of different spin on things. The one that's, I think, most different from the others is the Epson. It's the only one that uses an LCD panel instead of DLP panel for the imaging. And that, that definitely made a difference in the tests. All right. And uh, we'll just take kind of get us rolling into. Sure. So that on the left things. is yeah. Robert Zone. He, he's the owner of... Um, Value Electronics. It's a consumer electronics retailer in in Westchester. Um, you know, a little upstate from New York City, but still not technically upstate New York. Um, and then, of course, Phil Jones on the right, who um, works for Sound United, but he also owns a projector review site called ProjectorReviews.com. So he was the MC, and Robert was the host. Okay. And if you don't know what a UST projector is, this is um, it's a really cool technology. It's just like a little box that shoots right up almost almost vertically that paints like up to 150 inch image onto a screen or a wall, but really needs a screen to look its best. Yep. And uh, just unbelievably new technology. Um, and you saw the price ranges were about 3000 to 6,500 mm -hmm. for the models in this category. And any other insights on UST technology that you wanna highlight? Yeah, I mean, the technology has been around since about 2014, but it really in the last couple of years is when it's been heating up um, because more and more manufacturers are getting involved, um, which makes it a more competitive space. It gives us more offerings, you know, more more selections. Um, and I think consumers see it as a way of bringing home a really large screen um, without having to pay a lot for like a 100 inch flat panel because, you know, the 97 inch LG OLED is gorgeous, but it's twenty five thousand dollars. So this will give you 100, 120, as you said, even up to 150 inch screen for a lot less money and a lot less trouble than it takes to install a front project, uh, sorry, a, a long throw projector, which may right. be you know, ceiling mounted or it may have to be on a back wall. It's a little more complicated. So USTs are seen as TV replacements because they have built-in speakers, um, built-in streaming and a really large screen and they're pretty convenient to place. All right, pretty cool stuff. Let's. Uh jump into a little bit more of the technology. Uh, sure. How, how technical do you want to get with? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this. People can can read the slide. Uh, this is basically just a, a an illustration of how pixel shifting works on a DLP projector. 
So every panel in the event, every UST in the event did use some form of pixel shifting. And what pixel shifting does is it takes a like a 1080p or in, in this case in the in, in the DLP, the, the larger chip, it's a it's a kind of a it's a panel that has about half the resolution of 4K. And what they do is they shift the pixels. So they display one pixel and then another pixel diagonally uh, next to it or four pixels in kind of in a circle. And what that does is it, it allows um, a lower resolution chip to reproduce a higher actual resolution. And there's something called persistence of vision in the eye, human eye, that uh, makes it uh, very difficult to see that these images are being flashed up on the screen very quickly. So to our eyes, it looks really like uh, like 4K, um, okay. like true 4K resolution. Um, so three of the three of the um, uh, competitors, the AWOL, the Samsung, and the uh, not the LG uh, High Sense. Thank you, the High Sense. They all used 1080p chips and used four-way or quad-phase pixel shifting to create 4K. The LG had a little bit of an advantage because it, it does use the larger chip, the um, 0.66 inch TI right. um, digital mirror device. So it only has to pixel, sh pixel shift twice to get full right. 4K. The Epson also only pixel shifts twice or has two versions of each pixel, which means it's not actually displaying a native 4K. It's displaying twice the resolution of 1080p. Um, okay. Turns out detail is not actually the most important thing in a projector, and we'll, we'll get to that. But um, if you're looking for a, like a native projector that can display a, a 4K test pattern, the Epson's not able to do that. But the other ones aren't really either. They're all up. No, they are. No, they are. They're pixel shifting creates oh, to our pixel eye. Pixel shifting to get the actual 4K. Exactly. The, the gotcha. only other option would be getting um, a native 4K panel device, which are very expensive. Um, because if you think about it, you know, a TV has got 100 inches to fit all those pixels. A right. projector has 0.66 inches or right. even less than half an inch to fit 8 right. million pixels. That requires a whole nother level of engineering. Right. And that means those, those panels are very expensive. Right. And this is some of the technology of how the DLP laser stuff works. Yeah, so what this is, is um, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around, but basically there's a light source that comes in and there are these things called dichroic mirrors. And what they do is they absorb certain frequencies of light and reflect others. So there's one for red, one for blue, one for green, takes that light source, whether it's coming from a lamp or a laser, splits it out into a red, a green, and a blue. And then on the left side, you can see what's happening is they each, each of those primary colors gets shined or shown through um, a imaging device, LCD or DLP. And then there's a prism that combines those three back into a single beam of light that goes out through the lens. So this is how they break up the, the signal into its primary colors. They have a dedicated chip for each one of those colors and then converge right. it back together. So that's a three chip, that's how a three chip design works. And this is done for every pixel, every all? So if you think about it, this is how I kind of make sense of it. Each one of those in the in the little box on the left is it's basically a black and white image. It's a black and white LCD or DLP image that only passes like on, off, or some stage in between, right? It could be dark, it could be dim. But those three black and white images are shown with primary colored lasers, and that's what turns them into color images. And when you combine all three of the primary colors together, then you get an actual full color image. All right. Um, so the panels don't have color in them on an LCD TV. LCD TVs use a color filter or quantum mm. dots. Same thing with projectors. But instead of using a color filter in a three chip case, they split the light into its primaries and then recombine them after they've gone through the chips. All right. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, slightly. I hope it does because I just made it up. <laughs> slightly. It's, uh, all you have to know is that you plug it in. Literally, plug it in. You plug it you in. You got three chips, and you and get a sharp. You take picture. the remote, right? You take your yep. remote, and you say on. Like ultimately, <laughs> that's what you're going to do, good. and you're sure. going to get um, some of the images. So this is a, um, I guess this is some kind of skin tone test where they're comparing all the projectors. Yeah, you can see a couple of the outlines of the judges in this picture. Um, so we were in a dark room for many hours together. Um, <laughs> it, it it went fine. There were no incidents um, that I can speak of. Um, 
And we did have a lot of slides like this. Um, they're from the various uh, test disks that we use, um, you know, as content for the test. And uh, it allows you to see side by side just how well these projectors are reproducing skin tones. And, and again, it's not the only test that we did for color accuracy, but right. it's one of the better ones because, again, as humans, we, we have a pretty good I idea identifying, you know, what's a good skin tone and a bad one. And it, you can actually see some of this is because of the angle. But if you look at that, that's the exact same image going to five different projectors. And some of them look a little pinker and some of them look a little bluer. And that, you know, that's telling. That's really kind of... Um, right you know, the differences between the technologies. So, so, so my question is calibration can fix some of this stuff. Yes. But how much was calibrated and what did they do before? What was the, I guess, what was the thing that leveled the playing field? If there was anything that could level the playing field amongst. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. And at the TV shootouts, they uh, shoot shootouts. They always do a professional calibration of each display. Um, which, you know, when you're in this, you know, three to $4,000 TV price range, professional calibration is, it's not something everybody does, but it's certainly something I would want to do on, on my display. Um, in this case, they did not do a full calibration on each projector. What they did was they used a colorimeter and a CalMAN software um, to measure the color performance of each projector and set it into its out of the box setting that was the closest to accurate. Um, so they used user settings, not professional calibration, to um, to kind of represent, I think, what a consumer would do uh, when they get this projector home, right? They're going to set it into their cinema mode or their, you know, their vivid mode. God, let's hope not. Um, right. And then what they also did was they, they measured the color temperature of each and they adjusted the color temperature settings. Again, it's in the user menu um, right. to like the warm one or the natural or whatever the individual setting was that was closest to a D6500 pure, right. you know, pure white. I they, think additionally, that's... they made a couple of setting changes to brightness and contrast just to get the test patterns to show as, as well as they could. Okay. But that was it. They didn't do a full calibration on each set. Um, they did do separate preset settings for SDR versus HDR because you have to do that because the performance of each TV is going to be different, whether it gets standard dynamic range content or HDR high dynamic range content. Okay. But that was it. And I, I think I actually included the settings in the article back on acoustics. Okay. So people can, you know, if they have this projector, they can set it to that mode as well to see what they think. Okay. So if I summarize quickly, they did something like they set it to cinema mode or filmmaker right. mode if it mm -hmm. was a setting, which is generally the closest to that 6,500 Kelvin setting. Two different settings, one for color accuracy and okay. one for white accuracy. So uh, the, okay. the preset color mode and then also color temperature. It's a separate okay. setting and the, those are the two things they adjusted. And then again, if they needed to, they tweaked the brightness and contrast just a little bit. Okay, and then once that was done for each projector, they would run through a series of still images, moving images, all that kind of stuff. Exactly. And everyone's like running up to the screen super close or <laughs> yeah. were, you, were you back like 10, so, 20 feet? Yeah. What is that? Yeah. No, that's a really good question because I mean, how many people when they're home get right up next to the screen to look at the pixels? Um, very few. Um, but we did do that at times. I was not one of the judges. I was trying to maintain, you know, impartiality as a journalist. Um, but the judges end up, but I did go up to the screen because I want to see what these things look like too. Um, and it, it's only when you get up close to the screen, you start to see the differences in the resolution, like the Epson not doing full 4k, um, mm -hmm. the, the LG being able to do just dual pixel shifting gave it, I think an advantage in the detail department. Um, so we did some things in the test that probably aren't exactly indicative of what, a, a what you would normally do when watching a movie on your couch. But, you know, again, we, we're a bunch of techies. We want to see how these things are doing up right. close. So that's um, sometimes the only time you can tell the difference is when you're up close. Right. But so you were probably back 15 feet, 20 feet, most of the time, what less would than say? that, probably about 10 to 12 feet from each screen. And so, the screens were identical. Um, all of them used a 120-inch uh, uh, Seymour Screen Excellent. Um, what is it called? Um, it was one of their white formulations that, uh, that is zero gain, so unity gain. Right. Um, Robert's uh, feeling was that, yes, you could get these projectors to look better if you used an ambient light rejecting screen, which kind of focuses the light and rejects right. any of the ambient room light. But he wanted, um, he wanted accuracy. 
you know, mm. to to provide, like you said, a level playing field between the projectors to see right. what they could do on a pure white kind of blank slate. And right. then then you're really seeing what the projector can do. If you start putting in ALR screens or, you know, the ambient light rejecting screens, right. there could be some artifacts that's introduced by the screen itself. And, and that may not be the most accurate way to measure a projector or evaluate a projector. Right. So at this point, you don't know which projector. It's all hidden. You can't see any of them to know you don't get any sighted. No, that's not that true. No, we were told which one was which. Because, oh, really? You uh, yeah. didn't know which one. Okay. Well, A, there's a logo on each one, so it would have been hard you know, to cover that up. Um, okay. But also, um, they wanted to identify which was which, so people, the judges knew which one to score. Ah. They could have they could have just said you know one two three four five with a little sticker on it and tried right. to mask that a little bit but they didn't they didn't do that and I, okay. I think it's okay I mean yes people have brand biases when they come into this thing I right. like to think the judges would be objective about what they're seeing and right. reporting back even if they happen to own an Epson or an LG or right. a JVC or something so do you know by memory like which one was which like if you go to the far back left do you remember yeah. like yep. which one okay do alphabetical order. Oh, it's really? the a, a wall a vision on the left. It's okay. the Epson right next to it. It's the Hisense, uh, and then the LG, and then the Samsung. So they did put the UST projectors in alphabetical order. Okay. Because um, yeah, just on this picture, like just on the woman's necklace, you get that blue in two of them, and then her necklace looks white in the other three. Yeah. So I wouldn't use a, a digital photograph of screens to judge the screens right i would say that it does illustrate that there are differences but off angle also can look a little different than right. full on flat on so the only way to accurately judge and you know and make judgments about these is to be standing in front of it right um but i will say that the the camera here does show that there are differences and and, right. and yes i would say some of the projectors did create a more bluish kind of white by default, even when set to their warm color temperature compared right. to compared to others. Um, but the actual scores on the scorecard are, I think, a very good rep representation of what we saw in the room when we went right in front of each one of the screens. Because I could say, you know, right here, it looks like the Samsung on the far right is pinker than the LG right next to it. Right. Um, but when we were looking at it, that LG really had excellent color accuracy. Um, OK. So the fact that a little bit off axis looks a little bit blue compared to the right. one on its right doesn't mean that it was worse. Right. Was there, I mean, this is my question. Was there like a test monitor calibrated to what the actual colors should be? That you no, but there probably to? will be next time. Um, okay. They, at the TV shootout, one of the things they do is they bring a broadcast video monitor. It's like a $35,000 professional monitor that, that right. um, is also professionally calibrated to provide the reference. That I think would have been helpful. Um, uh, having a screen in the room would have uh, probably burnt our eyes out a little bit, you know, by mm. having such a like a bright flat panel next to all these, you know, kind of dimmer projectors. Yep. But I think what they're talking about is maybe putting it underneath like sort of a hood, mm. um, so you could basically kind of immerse yourself in the hood, look at the colors right. once, then you come out and then try to yeah. remember what it looked like, could compare right. it. it. It's tough when right. you're looking at something that's naturally quite a bit brighter. Right. and the displays around it to try to use that as a reference. But they talked about that, and I think everybody agreed that it would be nice to incorporate a broadcast video monitor in as a reference. Um, because again, with skin tones, we know what it should look like. But you know, for some content, you know, we weren't there when it was shot, so we don't know what the original color was. Right. Um, so, so I think that a, having a reference monitor would be a good idea. We did not have one of those this year. All right. Um, well, I think everyone's curious if they haven't read your article yet or looked at the site, which one is the best of the three or which one got rated the best based on all the clarifications, but um, maybe we'll just step through what they all look mm -hmm. like. So you can kind of see up front. Sure. That looks, um, is that the high sense? Yeah, that's the high sense. Okay. This is the, that's the Epson, Epson in yep, two black colors and, white. Uh -huh. and the a wall. Is that how you say it? A W O L a wall. Yeah. A -W -O -L, a -W -O -L. A -W -O -L. Yeah. That's what I'd okay. say. Yeah. All right. So uh, that's the Samsung mm -hmm. and that's the LG. Ooh, uh, the LG, the LG. So, so I'm I supposed feeling, to reveal the winner yet. Well, you can, you can <laughs> tease it out a little more if, if you want no, to I give any comments on any um, one individually that you had like, um, yeah, I guess. 
So I I'm, guess I'm referring my, back to guess, my phone just to get sorry, yeah. just to get the actual scores. The LG did win the competition. It it wasn't um there was no like no one complained about that finding. I think most of the judges found that overall it was the preferred image. I think uh, having the larger, you know, TI chip certainly helped. Um I think it's a it's a laser uh, light source as well, which made it very bright. Um, it scored an eight point five six overall, and the the thing about the LG was that it was very consistent between standard dynamic range and high dynamic range material. Um, in fact, I think its score was like eight point five five for one and eight point five seven for the other, and that's over like a total of fifteen different picture tests. Okay. So um, it was consistent in SDR and HDR. The next closest competitor was was the AWOL. Um, which, by the way, is is significantly cheaper. I think that one's right. about forty three hundred right now, and the LG is the most expensive at sixty five hundred. But the AWOL got a seven point eight six. Yep. Uh, the Epson actually came in third, which it was um, a good performance because it's the cheapest one in the category, um, thirty five hundred dollars. Okay, um, and if, apparently it's you know a little bit lower resolution. Again, half four K didn't really hurt the perception of picture quality because I mean ISF and everybody else says. Contrast is number one, color accuracy is number two, color saturation or volume is number three. Detail is actually considered to be the fourth most important element in picture quality. So I, you could probably put a 1080p projector up in there, and if it had a better contrast, people would vote it higher than these 4K projectors. Interesting. Um, yeah, and just looking at the score, all of them except for the Samsung seem to win some category. On some yeah, I was a little surprised that Samsung didn't didn't do as well because it is one of the more expensive um, projectors in the in the shootout. Um, I mean, it was a solid performer. It didn't get left in the dust, but it just it didn't yeah. excel in any one area that that I remember it from a you know from a shootout perspective. It was just it was kind of forgettable. It was there. It did some right. things pretty well, but it didn't excel in any one area. Well. What's interesting to me now the is, Samsung people are going to never speak to me again. But no, that's okay. It's life as a journalist. No, what's interesting <laughs> is I'm the I I'm the only one or sorry on the list. I have reviewed the Samsung and I've used it, so yeah. I have a reference point on that one. Right, and I could tell you, like living with it, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Like I love it, but right. it takes some calibration. It doesn't doesn't look good. If you just box. use the stock settings. Yeah. yeah. Like, and I think that probably, yeah, that was certainly a factor here. I mean, these are user settings, so they are, it's likely that this does represent what consumers are going to see. But right. if you're a consumer who's spending $6,500 in a projector, right. you know, spending the extra few hundred dollars for a professional calibration can make it into a much different display. I mean, right. the choices they make by default on these things is to make the image like punchy in a showroom and, mm you know, look good with football in a bright room. So people are like, wow, that looks great, right. you know? But right. if you're like us and you like watching movies, you turn the lights down, right? even the cinema settings or the filmmaker modes are probably still going to have a few things that you'd want to turn off in terms of processing or, right. um, or tweak to get the best performance. And again, you look at one of these in a dark room on its own, and yeah. any one any of these looks great. You know, it right. really it does 4K detail. It's got, you know... right. The, these differences are not night and day differences. They're pretty subtle and you have to go right. back and forth. And we did that a lot going back and forth to really say, okay, this one looks like it's got a little more detail um, on their own. Right. Each one of these would probably look great and would, you know, it's going to yeah. be, you know, a very fun experience at home. But when you right. see them side by side, you really start to see the finer differences between them. Right. So then do you recommend like spend the extra 3000 and get the LG or go with the Epson and get save 3000 and get almost as amazing quality like that's a big price difference it is i mean you know everybody's situation is different for some sixty five hundred dollars right. on a tv isn't yeah. isn't a lot to spend um the you know the the lg has the web os streaming so you know netflix works you know it's, right. it's funny we say that as if it's a joke but on a lot of the projectors that use android tv the netflix app is kind of hit or miss i mean i think there's mm. some kind of a licensing issue so like the four right. movie projector which is not here and probably, right. been, but you know, Robert right. was not able to get it uh, in time. Um, it's got Android TV. You can't. It's got no Netflix app that works on mm. the device. Netflix. I mean, one or two people use Netflix for streaming, right? Right. So yeah, yeah, there are workarounds. You can get a Fire TV stick. You can get a you know an Apple TV box to use as a streamer. Yeah. But but Epson is it's a whole finished packaged operating system that they've developed for the TVs for years. It works really well. It has all the apps on it. Right. Um, 
So, you know, it, it was better. It was better. Do you want to pay three thousand? It was three thousand dollars better. Again, that's going to be a yeah. personal choice. I I right. like the Epson a lot because it's bright. It's good for gaming. It's got like a twenty microsecond delay, right? Or millisecond. One of those seconds. It's got the little M and the S. I don't know. Millisecond. It's got millisecond. millisecond. Thank you. Um, it's a good gaming TV. Some people are going to be saying like, "Well, it isn't real. Or it isn't real 4K." I'm like, <laughs> true, but it takes a 4K source. It supports HDR. It does right. all the stuff that you need it to do for 4K material. And right. turns out, again, it came in third at a much lower price. So it seemed to do okay against, you know, the big boys. Right. And the other thing I want to point out is the Samsung is a 2020 model. It's about two years older than the right. LG, which just came out. Yeah. So it got some extra brightness and the LG had a little leg up. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure that, that contributed toward, you know, its placement where it was. Because this is a technology that again it's been around for a little while but it's right. really only gotten competitive in the last i'd say three years right and i think like you said the user interface what the menu lg maybe has a little leg up and samsung because they're both smart tv players yep. and they're going to yep. have all the apps and all the mm -hmm. things to go with it mm -hmm. um and the lesser known brands may or may not kind of have that which is yeah what of, you find that a lot of those brands is the the Android TV, you know, that's, that's the one that's, I guess it's easier for a manufacturer to license. Um, mm. It's a, it's a pretty solid platform that you can just pull in and put on your device. You know, Samsung and LG are developing these things in house. Right. Uh, LG actually bought the technology from Palm years ago and then developed it for their own purposes. Okay. Um, so if you're not buying a name brand, you're probably going to end up with an Android TV USD projector. And there are some limitations to that. All right. On the inputs, are they all HDMI 2.1 close to I that? Or no. I wouldn't even quote no. myself on that because okay. I would say probably if the Samsung's two years old, it's probably HDMI 2.0. Right. Um, but don't quote me. You know, the yeah. specs would have to be looked up. Um, right. It didn't impact any of what we were doing because we were just looking at right. standard, you know, 4K with HDR. Right. You know, we didn't really look at HDR plus. We didn't look at Dolby Vision. I don't think any of the projectors actually supports Dolby Vision, or if they do, maybe the AWOL. In fact, the, the AWOL might. Um, but we didn't look at any content okay. that that would be, you know, let's say unfairly represented right. in one TV that has that processing than another TV right. doesn't. So everything that was HDR was just standard right. HDR 10. And I did notice there was an SDR category on the scorecard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're, I mean... That's important, but not that important. I think for a lot of people with projectors, they're probably not watching low resolution content. Okay, you're conf things. you're conflating standard definition with standard dynamic range. Standard oh, is dynamic that range SDR? Just oh, means, okay, gotcha. Yeah, no, I got like Blu-rays. All Blu-ray right. discs are SDR. Ah. Uh, broadcast TV is SDR. Um, uh, you know, 4K recordings that don't have HDR are SDR. So gotcha. there's still a lot of content out there, you know, every football game, every soccer game, et cetera, it's yeah. all SDR. So we, that had to be in a category because, you know, the Blu-ray disc and the streaming that does have 4K and HDR is still a relatively small sample compared to what's out there in, in standard dynamic range. No, that's but a good question. They did also include 480i and 1080i content, oh. you know, okay. legacy stuff, um, just to show how well the TV's upconverted. And they were all pretty good at it. Um, okay. And yeah, who's watching 480i? at all right. anymore, probably nobody, you know, right. so that doesn't yeah, matter yeah. as much, but the SDR category standard dynamic range is, is still mm. important because of the ah, yeah, I completely range. misread that. So yeah, no thank problem. you for correcting SDR is just standard dynamic range, not, Correct. um, not, 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 standard not, HD, not standard. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. All right. Um, well, you're going to probably edit that out to make yourself look like a genius. I anyways. don't know about that. We'll we'll keep it in. <laughs> we'll keep it in. Anything right. else you wanted to add about the ultra short throw projector? Shoot. Well, I think it's um, you know, because I hung around a little bit after hours because I was you know writing up my articles and and uh, there's a lot of work involved in these events. Mm. Um, you know, they um, guy Jason from Meridio had been there like two three days in advance. He had even done some calibration and set up and testing on these units before he left uh, Florida. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of preparation. I mean, yeah, we're sitting there for eight hours thinking, oh, my God, it's such a slog. But they do a lot of work. They're there late nights setting everything up. So, you know, kudos to uh, to Robert and to Jason from Meridio and to Brent from right. uh, from uh, Metro AV who provided the cables and, you know, 
emotional support <laughs> during the event. Right. And um, they did they did a really good job. They're going to get criticized for not doing the calibrations or for this or for that or not having a reference monitor. But honestly, they I think I think it was a great event. Right. No, it sounds fantastic. Um, if you're in the market for an ultra short throat projector, um, we think any of these will probably be good. But if you can afford the LG, that seems like the one to keep on your radar for right now. And all right. I approve this message. <laughs>